In this lecture, I want to talk about something known as the conjunction fallacy. Suppose that I tell you some information. Suppose that I tell you that Linda is 31 years old, she's single, outspoken, and very bright. And she majored in philosophy. And then as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. And also she participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And now I ask you a question. Which of the following two propositions is more probable? One, Linda is a bank teller. Or two, Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. So take a moment, perhaps pause the video, and answer this question for yourself. Which of these two propositions, given this evidence that I've given you up here about Linda, which of these two propositions is more probable? This question, or this experiment, was done by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, two very famous and well-known psychologists and economists. And what they found is that a large percentage of people say that two is more probable than one. That is, they say that Linda is a bank teller and is active in a feminist movement is more probable than Linda being a bank teller. Now, why is that puzzling? Well, let's look at a Venn diagram. Let's let B be the proposition that Linda is a bank teller. And F is the proposition that Linda is active in the feminist movement. Now, B and F is the intersection of these two propositions. So this is B and F. B and F is a subset or is contained inside of the proposition B. So since B and F implies B, so being a bank teller and active in the feminist movement implies that you're a bank teller, according to the rules of probability, we know that the probability of B and F must be smaller than or equal to the probability of B. So it seems that most people are, are answering con contrary to what probability theory tells them. So what's going on? So here's the issue. We have some evidence E. This is the evidence that was given to you about Linda. And then you are asked, which is more prob probable? B, Linda is a bank teller, or B and F? Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Now, as I just said, the probability that B is true must be greater than or equal to the probability that B and F is true. And that's true even if you condition on some piece of evidence. So the probability of B given E must be greater than or equal to the probability of B and F given E. But E may be positively relevant for B and F and less so than to B. So one thing that might be going on here is that the evidence that the, the people received when doing this experiment is more positively relevant to Linda being a bank teller and active in the feminist movement than it is to just the simple fact that Linda is a bank teller. So let's think about this as a principle of reasoning. We'll call this the conjunction principle. So here it is in, sort of in a informal, uh, an informal statement of the principle. If E is good evidence for P and Q, then E is good evidence for P. Now, of course, the question is, what exactly does good evidence mean? What does it mean to say that E is good evidence for P or good evidence for P and Q? One way to represent it or formalize it is to think of E as being good evidence for P and Q to just be represented by E implies P and Q in classical logic or sentential logic. Then the principle would be you have a premise, E implies P and Q, so therefore E implies P. And we can see that this is in fact a valid argument. So if you have the premise E implies P and Q, then the conclusion E implies P, then this is a valid argument. Why is it valid? Well, here is a truth table for P, Q, and E. There are eight rows because there are three atomic propositions. Now, if we restrict attention 
to all of those rows in which E implies P and Q is true. That's restricting attention to these two rows, this row here, uh, the, this, this row right here, and then finally the last row. So all the rows where I highlighted blue in this middle column. Then we just need to check, is E imply P true in all of those rows? Well, we see that in all the rows where we highlight blue in this middle column, E implies P is highlighted blue in those columns as well, or in those rows as well. So, in fact, E implies P and Q, therefore E implies P, that is a valid argument. But the question is, what about these other properties of arguments? being evidentially supporting, the premises evidentially supporting the conclusion, or the premises being relevant to the conclusion. That is, is it true that if E evidentially supports P and Q, then E evidentially supports P? That is, if the probability of P and Q given E is high, then so is the probability of P given E. Second question, is it true that if E po is positively relevant for P and Q, then E is positively relevant for P. The answer to the first question, as I've already noted, is yes. If the probability of P and Q given E is greater than one half, then the probability of P given E must be greater than one half. And that's because this probability, the probability of P given E, must be greater than or equal to the probability of P and Q given E. So if we know that this is greater than one half, then this probability here, the probability of P given E must be greater than one half. And that follows from this general fact. If you give me any propositions X, Y, and Z, the probability of X given Z is always gonna be greater than or equal to the probability of X and Y given Z. But what about E being positively relevant for P and Q? Does that imply E is positively relevant for P? Well, as might be suggested from the discussion of the Linda Bankteller problem, in fact, the answer is no. E can be positively relevant for P and Q without being positively relevant for P. That is, I might be able to find a stochastic truth table where the probability of P and Q given E is greater than the probability of P and Q, and that does not necessarily imply that the probability of P given E is greater than the probability of P. So I can find a, prob uh, a stochastic truth table where this first inequality is true, the probability of P and Q given E is greater than the probability of P and Q, yet it's not the case that the probability of P given E is greater than the probability of P. So let's first show that one is true. So here, as a reminder, is the truth table that illustrates the fact that E implies P and Q, therefore E implies P, is a valid argument. Now let's turn this into a stochastic truth table. So pick any stochastic truth table. So P1 up to P8, these are numbers, all greater than zero, whose sum adds up to one. And I want to show you that it doesn't matter what numbers I chose, it's always going to be the case that the probability of P given E is greater than or equal to the probability of P and Q given E. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna take the stochastic truth table and we're gonna condition on E. So what does that mean? Well, that means we're going to restrict attention to those rows in which E is true. And all the other rows are going to be set to zero because we're conditioning on E. We're supposing that E is the case. Now, how does that change the probabilities? Well, going to this original table, we see that E is true. The probability that E is true is P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7. So it's P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7. That's the probability that E is true. And so what we have to do is we have to take the ratio, so it's P1 divided by the probability that E is true. That's gonna be the probability of the first row. The probability of the third row is P3 divided by P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7. 
and similarly for this fifth row and the seventh row. So the new probabilities after conditioning by E is going to be these, the, 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 these fractions right here, P1 divided by P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7, and so on. Now, what is the probability of P given E and the probability of P and Q given E? Well, we just want to look what is the rows in which P is true in this new stochastic truth table. Well, all the non-zero rows. And it's this first row and the third row. So the probability of P given E is going to be P1 plus P3 all divided by, they have the same denominator, P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7. What about the probability of P and Q given E? Well, that's only this first row right here. So the probability of P and Q given E is P1 divided by P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7. So we can see here that no matter what numbers we choose, as long as this sum, P1 plus P3 plus P5 plus P7, is greater than 0, so we're not dividing by 0, as long as that sum is greater than 0, then this number, the probability of P given E, is always going to be greater than or equal to the, the number P and uh, the probability of P and Q given E. Why? Well, P1 plus P3 is always greater than or equal to P1 because P1 and P3 are both numbers that are greater than or equal to 0. They might be equal if P3 is equal to 0, but this number, P1 plus P3, is always going to be greater than or equal to P1. So now what about the second property? The second property was that E may be positively relevant to P and Q, yet not be positively relevant to P. So to illustrate a failure of that reasoning, let's look at this example right here. Suppose you have a normal deck of cards, a normal deck of 52 cards. And let's think of these three propositions. B, the card is black. A, the card is an ace. And S, the card is a spade. I claim that the probability that you have an ace of spades, given that somebody tells you you have a black card, is greater, strictly greater, than the probability that you have an ace of spades. So the, the story here is you have a normal deck of cards, you are randomly dealt one card, you haven't looked at it, and you want to know what's the probability, say, that you have an ace of spades. And you want to compare that to the probability that you have an ace of spades, given that somebody looks at it and says, hey, you have a black card. However, the probability that you have an ace, given that you have a, that you were told that it's a black card, is the same as the prior probability that you have an ace. So let's look at a stochastic truth table to illustrate these two inequalities. So taking a normal deck of cards, this is the stochastic truth table you would get assigning probabilities to each of these different rows. So this row right here is the probability that you randomly select an ace that is a spade and also a black card. Well, there's one ace of spades, which is, of course, a black card. So that probability is going to be one out of 52. What about the second row right here? Well, this would be the probability that you have an ace, which is a spade, but not a black card. Well, no such card exists. There's no such thing as an ace of spades that's not a black card, because if it's a spade, it must be a black card. So the probability of that happening is zero. So what about this row right here? This is the probability that you have an ace, which is not a spade, but a black card. That means you have an ace of clubs, because there's only one other card that's a black card, which is also an ace. So that probability is one out of 52. So you may want to pause the video and make sure you can justify to yourself the remaining probability. Now, let's do the calculation. What's the probability that you have an ace of spades, given that it's a black card, and we want to compare that to the probability that it's just an ace of spades? Well, let's just quickly look at the probability that it's an ace of spades. So A and S are true in these first two rows right here. 
So the probability that it's an ace of spades is going to be 1 out of 52, which is what we expected. And what about the probability that you have an ace? Well, the probability that you have an ace, A is true in these first four rows right here. So this is 2 plus 1 plus 1. That's 4 out of 52. 4 out of 52 is 1 out of 13. So the, the prior probability, the initial probability that you've selected an ace is 1 out of 13, and the initial probability that you selected an ace of spades is 1 out of 52. So now let's ask, what happens if somebody tells you that the card you've selected is a black card? Well, we can recalculate these probabilities conditioning on the fact that somebody told you that you have a black card. So condition on receiving a black card, there are 26 black cards and 26 red cards. So given that you know that you have a black card, there's a 1 out of 26 chance that you have an ace of spades. And similarly, there's a 1 out of 26 chance that you have an ace, which is not a spades, that is, it's an ace of clubs, and so on. So what's the probability that it's an ace of spades given that it's a black card? Well, that is 1 out of 26. 1 out of 26 is greater than 1 out of 52. So learning that the card you're holding is a black card raises the probability that it's an ace of spades. That is, learning that it's a black card is positively relevant to it being an ace of spades. However, learning that it's a black card doesn't raise the probability that it's an ace. The probability that it's an ace after learning that it's a black card would be 1 out of 26 plus 1 out of 26, which is 2 out of 26, which equals 1 out of 13. So your prior probability was 1 out of 13 that it was an ace. Somebody tells you that it's a black card, and your probability that it's an ace doesn't change. It's only your probability that it's an ace of spades that it goes up. So to summarize, we have this conjunction principle, which is if E is good evidence for P and Q, then E is good evidence for P. And we saw that we could formalize or make more precise this informal rendering of the conjunction principle in three different ways. We can first of all ask, is it a deductive valid argument that from E implies P and Q, we conclude E implies P? And we saw that that is a valid argument. Second, we saw that if E evidentially supports P and Q, then E must evidentially support P. That is, in every stochastic truth table, assuming the probability of E is greater than zero, then if the probability of P and Q given E is greater than a half, then the probability of p given e must also be greater than one half. However, we saw that we can find stochastic truth tables where e may be positively relevant for p and q without being positively relevant for p. That is, there's a stochastic truth table where the probability of p and q given e is greater than the probability of p and q. However, the probability of p given e is not greater than the probability of p. They may be equal, or maybe the probability goes down. 